Harriet, and I'm from Melbourne, Australia. And this talk is about community building with the help of sociolinguistics. So I'll be talking about what sociolinguistics is, how it's relevant to us, and how each of us can use sociolinguistic techniques in our day-to-day -day communications to make the JavaScript community more welcoming for everyone and a really nice thing to be a part of. Uh, before we get too deep into that, uh, like I said, I'm from Melbourne, and I work at BuildKite as a technical writer. Uh, we're a continuous integration platform, uh, so our product is mostly used by other developers. This means I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how best to explain parts of our product to technical users who may or may not be familiar with CI. Um, I'm also doing my Masters of Applied Linguistics at the University of Melbourne, and my main area of interest is the intersection of linguistics and computer science. Uh, from there, I started looking at language communities and how they're built, and that led to me writing a paper on programming language communities, uh, which inspired this talk. So let's talk about communities. What is a community? Really, it's just a bunch of people all together, all doing the same thing. And in linguistics, we call this a community of practice, a place where we do shared meaning making. And usually, we use this term for a community that's formed around a specific goal, like a project or an open source tool. But we can take this a bit further, and we can look at the communities that form around programming languages. And they're communities of practice, just like the ones that form around natural languages. And we need to keep in mind what our community looks like from the outside as well as from the inside, because this is what we look like to potential new members. So when a person wants to join a new community, they need to learn how we do things differently. So we're all part of the JavaScript community, and likely many other communities as well. So think about the general feeling that you get when you see people online talking about using JavaScript versus talking about using Ruby versus talking about using Golang. It's all slightly different. So these types of things can be roughly divided into two categories. We've got language and culture. So language things are jargon and community-wide in-jokes. And cultural things are our approach to open source, our diversity strategy, our uh, approach to solving problems. Um, these are problems with communication as well as programming problems. So language can also be described as linguistic factors. And cultural ones can be considered social factors. If we mush these things together, we get sociolinguistics. So some definitions to start with. So sociolinguistics is the study of how language functions in a society. And this is a really broad field, and it covers way too much stuff for, the, for this talk today. So something more relevant to us is language socialization. This is becoming a member of a society through the use of language. So I said this talk would be about sociolinguistics. Actually, I lied. It's about language socialization. And in the natural language learning sense, this is about all the words that we use and all the other stuff that's not words. So you might be familiar with this concept. You might have found that it's easier to learn a language if you're in the country that it's speaking it. And that's because you get all the pronunciation, the slang, body language, and other important stuff all at the same time. And all of this together is socialization. So being a part of a community means that you're helping to build it. And we want nice communities. We want people to feel welcome, and we want it to be easy to join. And these things are important because we want more people to come and be part of the JavaScript magic. So let's have a look at how we can do this better. So JavaScript people are actually already pretty great at this stuff compared to a lot of other tech communities. Uh, so what does socialization look like in practice? The most important thing for us is the language that we use when we talk about JavaScript. So different programming languages have different ways of being a member. So how do we let people know what our special JavaScript way of doing things is? We use socialization strategies. And there's heaps of them, and I'm not going to cover them all today. Uh, so I picked out some and divided them into three categories. We've got welcoming, learner-focused, and community-focused strategies. So we'll start with welcoming. And there's two different types of welcoming. We've got positive welcoming and negative welcoming. So an example of positive is a tweet something like this. So here's some of my tiny project. Learning this thing was hard, but was also fun and worth it. Oh. Thank you. Uh, so let's break this down into sections. So here's some of my tiny project. So this little bit actually tells us quite a lot about our community of practice. It tells us that posting a very small project or a fragment of one is totally normal, and that things don't have to be huge, brilliant ideas, and they don't need to be finished or perfect to share them. And learning this thing was hard. This shows people reading the tweet that JavaScript developers are comfortable with vulnerability, and it makes vulnerability OK for others as well. And finally, but also was fun and worth it. So there's payoff for all this work that you're putting in. And you don't have to finish things for them to be worthwhile. So these three parts together, when viewed from outside the JavaScript community, welcome people in a positive fashion. 
So seeing tweets like this fosters goodwill towards our community and could even spark people's interest in learning JavaScript. So tweets like these are great for users new to JavaScript, but it's also nice for people who are already members. It helps everyone to feel more comfortable about using JavaScript and being associated with our community. So as a side note, it's often not possible for people in minority groups to post things like this. Uh, they can be seen as less capable and less experienced, even if they're extremely capable and extremely experienced. And it's potentially damaging to their job opportunities. So for those of you who are in positions of privilege, please use that to make this type of communication the norm. So next up, we have negative welcoming. So I've made this pull request. How about this for the footer? And my friend has commented, lol, so gross. And this might be an in-joke, and we both know that it's sarcasm. But for anyone who's not in our exclusive little sarcasm club, this looks really mean. But it's obviously a joke, right? Well, no. It makes it look like we attack the quality of contributors' work and make light of their efforts. And it could be alienating for existing team members as well as newcomers and entirely scare off potential external contributors. So negative welcoming like this and other types of hazing uh, confronts new members with their shortcomings. So imagine seeing this if you've only just started working with JavaScript and you thought this pull request looked pretty great. You're likely to think, oh, if this is what they're saying about this code, what are they going to say about mine? And that's pretty discouraging. So next, we've got learner-focused strategies. And the first one of those is legitimation. So this is telling learners and members that the thing that they've been working on is legitimate. It's being encouraging to people working in JavaScript or on a particular project. It's kind of like positive reinforcement. So it's hard to be in the JavaScript community if no one recognizes the work that you're doing as an appropriate use of JavaScript. For example, a colleague has posted this pull request, updates the new sign-up page, and I've commented, cool, merged. And at first glance, this is really friendly and supportive. But what if we took it a step further with something more like this? Nice use of props. You're really getting the hang of React, merged. And this isn't much longer, and it conveys the same message as the previous comment. But importantly, it makes it so clear to the author of this pull request that the work they've done is a good use of the language that they're working in. We can also use this strategy if someone has tried a new approach to a problem that didn't work out or on a pull request that isn't going to be merged. And these scenarios shouldn't delegitimize the work that's been done. And we can make sure that the authors of these requests still feel positive about working in JavaScript just by changing how we talk about it. So this leads to the next strategy, normalizing failure. So failing to complete a task shouldn't reflect on you as a person or on your coding ability. We all know that writing JavaScript is hard and that we're not perfect all the time. And we need to make sure that juniors and people outside our community know that as well, as well as our existing members. So for example, I've been trying to use, stop using the words easy and simple in the documentation that I write. So say we have some setup instructions. Setup instructions for super rad project. Get set up with our short and easy instructions. Simply spin up a Docker container, run tests, and run build. So we've got both the words easy and simple here. And these instructions are fine if you know how to do all of the steps and they run smoothly. But if you don't know how to use Docker, or if anything goes wrong, we've undercut our users' confidence that, because we've told them that they should be finding this easy. By adding a few bits to these instructions, we can make people more comfortable with not succeeding on their first shot. So let's add some more to that introduction. So these steps below will help you set up Super Rad Project. If you run into any trouble, check out FAQs or ask a question in Slack. So we've removed the word easy, which is a great start. And by mentioning that you may need help, we're immediately normalizing the possibility of failing to set this up. So we can make the list of instructions better too. So spin up a Docker container, run tests with Mocha, and build the code with npm run build. So by removing the word simply from the first step, we've changed the expectations about how difficult this task is going to be. And by adding links to more information, we've removed the unreasonable assumption that you already know what you're doing and you don't have to look things up. So these learner-focused strategies, legitimation and normalizing failure, work together to make it easier, easier for us all to persevere when we're faced with problems that we don't know how to solve. So next, we've got self-efficacy. This is about supporting people's belief in their own ability to succeed. So a study was conducted in 2012 into first-year university students' perceptions of their coding abilities while learning how to program. To summarize the study, if they didn't believe in their own ability to successfully write code, both their performance and mental well-being decreased dramatically. So one of the major takeaways from the study was that if students have a much higher ratio of successes to failures when they're learning, they're much more likely to develop resilience and positive self-efficacy. So we can help our communities have a higher ratio of successes by reframing tasks. 
So if your team has a new project or new contributors, you could start by tagging all your tasks, even if it's something that you'll be working on personally. So lots of projects use tags on their issues, something like these. So our issue is update team photos to use new module with the tags front end, new contributor, and get started. And these tags are great. They flag things clearly as being appropriate for people starting out. But I think we can do one better. What if we were tagging with more useful and less junior-oriented language? Something like these. React only, self-contained, documented. So these provide even more information. And they also aren't specifically targeting people who haven't previously contributed to this project. But juniors will still be able to identify this as a task that they're capable of. And it provides all of the pertinent knowledge straight up. So rather than having to look through the issue description, you'll, it tells you that it's only React, so you know you won't find yourself wading through a C library. And adding that it's documented lets contributors know that if they're having a hard time, there is accessible help available. So having put a bit of extra work into these tags, this issue already feels much less like a busy work junior task and like the legitimate useful work that it is. And it's also much more appealing to developers at other stages of their career. So as a senior developer, you don't always want to be re-architecting parts of your project or shaving yaks and solving complex bugs. Sometimes you need small, self-contained tasks. So the last line of focus st strategy that I'm going to talk about today is legitimate peripheral participation. And this is ways to contribute to the JavaScript community that aren't writing code, but are still an important part of being a member. So it's things like upvoting Stack Overflow questions and answers, or even asking and answering yourself. Uh, writing blogs and Medium articles, and tweeting about things that you've done or challenges that you're facing. And making these activities just as important as writing code makes our community easier to join and easier to be a part of for existing members. So while writing code is a core part of our community, having other activities be equally important is way more fun and provides us all with legitimate ways to engage when we can't or don't want to be writing code. So finally, we're going to look at community-focused strategies. And the first one we've got is active participation. So this is about encouraging people to actually do this communication. And we don't get awesome communities without people interacting with each other. So even though this is called active participation, this covers activities like reading blog posts and Stack Overflow, as well as more obviously active things like interacting and talking with other developers and attending meetups. So everyone here has already taken a great step for this one by attending this conference. And now you can all take it a step further. So tell all the people that you meet today about what you're working on, even if you don't think it's particularly exciting. Or if you're willing to really commit to improving your community, tell people what you're struggling with. You might find yourself talking to someone who has had that exact same web config bug and can tell you how to fix it. So next, we've got strategies for getting help. This is about defining how people can find help relating to your project. And this applies to internal projects as well as external ones. So rather than listing the names of the maintainers on your readme or your projects page like this, have a go at figuring out and writing down some of the ways that people can get help relating to your project. And we want to define as much as we can so that people are comfortable trying to help themselves. And if that doesn't work out, then they're comfortable asking others for help as well. And this can be scary. It's kind of like calling up to book your own doctor's appointment. Talking to people on the phone is generally not a good time, but it's vastly improved if you know what you should say and you know when you need to say it. And in the same way, asking for help with JavaScript can be much less difficult if you know that there are steps that you can follow. So let's add some more to this readme. We could add sections for debugging. So maybe different parts of your project have different debugging strategies, like installation versus running tests. You can add frequently asked questions, community support, so if you have Slack groups or local meetups that people can attend, and even a section on where to ask questions, so other places that people can go to ask questions if they can't sort out their problems for themselves. So where to ask questions is really a whole point of its own, which leads me to my final community focus strategy, support structures. Now, these are really vital, because there are so many different places that you can get help in the JavaScript community. We've got thousands of online tutorials, we've got meetups, we've got Twitter, there's conferences, GitHub issues, Slack groups, and so many more. Uh, but we need to let people know where they can get help and that it's OK to do so. So our community does this pretty well. We encourage people to talk about things that have gone badly as well as things that have worked. But we can set an even better example for newcomers by posting about things that we've learned at every level. So it doesn't just have to be new developers talking about what they've learned in their first experiences with JavaScript, or senior developers talking about super deep, advanced technical concepts. Post about how you've been working with JavaScript for five years and you just set up your first Express server the other day, or how you finally looked up what that node and error actually means. 
By opening up the conversation about learning at all levels, we create and define the support structures for all of our members, no matter where they are in their JavaScript journey. So let's recap. Socialization is all of the things that we do to become members of a new community. And all the things that I've talked about are used all of the time in natural language learning and are really super effective about building strong language communities. And they're all things that we can start learning using in our programming communities. So let's start thinking about the language that we're using when we're interacting with our fellow developers, when we're training new team members, when, we're, when friends ask about JavaScript or start using it for the first time, and especially when we post on the internet about using JavaScript. By thinking about the language that we use when we talk about JavaScript, each of us can make our community friendlier, more comfortable, and more welcoming for new people and new ideas. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.